Now we're going to look at the distinction between interpretation and application. All this information is taken directly from our main textbook for Bible Study Toolbox, How to Enjoy the Bible, by E. W. Bollinger. He begins by making this statement, which we will understand better as we look into the difference between interpretation and application. Bollinger says, the interpretation is the foundation upon which the application is built. There can be no building until the foundation is laid. First, let's get some dictionary definitions of our two words. Interpretation means the act of explaining the meaning of something to decipher it. Application is defined as the act of putting to a special use or purpose to utilize. In order to show us how this works, Bollinger directs us to the account in Jeremiah of the potter and the clay. In Jeremiah 18 verses 1 through 4 we read, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. So God told Jeremiah to go to the potter's house so he could speak to him there. Jeremiah saw the potter make one vessel, which he determined to be flawed. So the potter took that same clay and reworked it into another vessel, which was good. Then God gives Jeremiah the interpretation of what he was illustrating with the work of the potter. We read that in Jeremiah 18, 5 through 6. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Here God tells Jeremiah that the clay represents Israel, and just as the nation of Israel has become flawed, God will not mend what man has marred, but will instead make an end of it and put a new thing altogether in its place. Here's God's interpretation, is that he would not mend the nation, but that he would make a new nation, a new Israel, in whom he could put a new spirit and write a law in their hearts. Further on in the book of Jeremiah, we receive more information about the subject to gain a deeper understanding. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 read, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Bollinger points out that verse 31 says this is a new covenant with the houses of Israel and Judah and is not talking about the body of Christ. So this is God's promise to Israel which will be fulfilled in the future. The interpretation is that God will not mend what has become flawed, but will rework it into something new and better. Bollinger now takes this interpretation and applies it to other teachings in God's Word. These are the six examples which he masterfully presents in his book. First, the application of that interpretation to the heavens and the earth. In 2 Peter 3.13 we read, But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The application is that God will not mend this earth which has been damaged, but he will make a new heavens and a new earth. Secondly, the application of that interpretation, Bollinger applies to mankind. He says God does not mend or reform the natural man. Here are some 
verses that back that up. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So that's the natural man, the ones that act like Adam. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. In Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So God does not mend or reform the natural man. Instead, he makes a new man, a new creation in Christ, bestowing a new nature. We read that in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, new things have come. Another place that the application of the interpretation of the potter and the clay can be applied is to covenants. God will not mend the covenant he made with Israel, which Israel broke. We saw that when we read Jeremiah 31, 32, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. So instead of mending that covenant, instead God will make a new covenant with Israel. We read that in Hebrews 8, 7, and 13. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. When God said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Yet another place that the application of the interpretation can be applied is to sacrifices. The sacrifices which were ordained by God in the Old Testament were still marred and really couldn't be mended. Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So God opened up a new and living way by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, a sacrifice that only had to take place once to bring about full forgiveness and deliverance. Hebrews 10.10 10 and 12. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Bullinger also shows us how the application of the interpretation can be applied to government. The kings and priests of olden times failed. All nations seek, strive, and struggle to attain a better government by human remedies, reforms, and revolutions. But God has said none of these human forms will endure. Ezekiel 21, 26, and 27 read, Thus says the Lord God, Remove the turban, or that's a crown, and take off the crown. This will no longer be the same. Exalt that which is low, and abase that which is high. A ruin, a ruin, a ruin, I will make it. This also will be no more until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Currently, Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22. And God put all things in subjection under Jesus Christ's feet and gave him, Jesus Christ, as head over all things to the church. Christ is also the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, for it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And eventually, Jesus will be crowned as King of Kings. Philippians 2, 9 and 10 read, For this reason also God highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Revelation 19.16 And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So God will not mend man's versions of government. Instead, he will set up his own perfect government. And finally, Bollinger says the application 
that God will not mend what has become flawed, but will, will rework it into something new and better, can be applied to our physical bodies. Our human bodies became damaged after the fall and subject to sickness and death. In other words, they're mortal. We can mend sickness and delay death, but we cannot avoid it. But God will not mend these bodies. Instead, he will provide new bodies, immortal, spiritual ones. 2 Corinthians 15, 47 and 49 and verse, the second part of verse 52 show us these things. The first man, Adam, is from the earth, earthy. The second man, Jesus Christ, is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so are also those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. We will be changed. So Bollinger has showed us how the interpretation of the passage in Jeremiah 18, and that interpretation was that God will not mend what has become flawed, but will rework it into something new and better, can be applied to other passages in God's word. He took us through six that it can be applied to the heavens and the earth, that God will not mend this earth which has been damaged, but he will make a new heavens and a new earth. He applied it to mankind, that God does not mend or reform the natural man. Instead, God makes a new man, a new creation in Christ, bestowing a new nature, and that's us. He make, he, we can apply it to covenants. God does not mend the covenant he made with Israel, which Israel broke, but he makes a new covenant with them. We can apply it to sacrifices, since the sacrifices ordained by God were flawed and could not be mended. So God opened up a new way by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We can apply that interpretation to government. The governments that man establishes strive, struggle, and fail, and God isn't trying to fix them. Instead, at the present time, Christ serves as the head of the body, and eventually God will establish Jesus Christ as the King of Kings. And finally, we can apply the interpretation that God will not mend what has become flawed, but will rework it into something new and better to our very own physical bodies. After the fall, our human bodies became mortal. Instead of God mending these bodies, he will provide new immortal bodies at the time of the return of Christ. We have to be sure, however, that when we apply an interpretation that those applications are in harmony with the general teaching of the whole word of truth. So just to look again at our definitions, interpretation is the act of explaining the meaning of something to decipher. An application is the act of putting to a special use or purpose to utilize. I've heard it taught that the context determines the application of scripture we can also apply principles and ideas from interpretation to scriptures in more remote context, as we saw Bollinger demonstrate here. This is probably not something most of us will necessarily do consciously, but the more we learn about God and his word, the more often we might find ourselves utilizing or applying the understanding, interpretation, of various Bible truths. I thought the way that he showed the carrying over of the interpretation and application was so interesting that that's just why I wanted to include this short lesson in Bible Study Toolbox. In Lesson 19, we will offer a short presentation about the limits of inspiration.